man of God. Uh, I have known him for many years. He is truly a father to us here at Mavuno. He is the husband of one wife. I hope that he is still the husband of one wife. I will investigate the situation and take appropriate actions if he has deviated from the course. He is a father to three wonderful children. He is more fearless than me. <laughs> and they have powerful names. I mean, me, I just have names from Western Kenya here. Dagae, Avedi. This man has children called Covenant. If you have been giving your children hohehahe names, okay, you need to stop and seek advice from this couple. So Covenant was the first one. They didn't think that was enough. Then they named the second one Promise. Hey! hey. And the third one they named Baraka. So if you are expecting to expect a baby, think about seeing these people. He is the founder and CEO of Transform Nations. He's the author of several books, including Ombi, which is our prayer manual, our prayer experience here at Mavuno. This man, I envy him and aspire. He has traveled the world sharing the gospel. And in this very city of Nairobi, he's the leading voice on the topic of real men. Mavuno, would you rise to your feet and help me welcome to the stage my friend, our pastor, Pastor Simon. Pastor Simon, the man, Bevy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> thank you, Pastor S. Can we pray for you, our pastor? We love you. We appreciate you. Father, we thank you. We give you the glory for joy and fun times and laughter in the house of the Lord. And we thank you that we have the opportunity to reflect on your word. As we have come here, we have many situations in our lives. And we are asking you to speak to us authoritatively, speak to us personally, speak to us pastorally. Father, our nation needs men. And so we pray that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would rest on your servant and that the word of God will come to us with authority and power to challenge and to change our lives. We surrender to you and we pray your blessing upon Pastor Simon. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name and God's people said, amen. God bless you. God bless you, Pastor S. Thank you. Come on, let's give it up for the woman of God. <laughs> Pastor Linda, I have missed you. And good to see you. How are you all doing? Come on, how are you all doing? Look at your neighbor and tell them happy new month. I'm glad to be here and to see all of you. And for some of you who have been new to this place, then you may not know my queen. So let me ask my queen to stand and show off. Right. Um, this morning she asked me, how do I look, honey? I said, before I answer how you look, who paid for that dress? <laughs> uh, so let me tell you publicly, you look awesome. You look great. Uh, well, that's not for you, so don't clap. Uh, it's a private affair. <clears throat> I'm glad to be here and to be sharing with you. As you've been told, uh, I've been a proud member of Mavuno. I've been traveling a little bit here and there, so I've not been with you for a while. But God has been good, uh, very good. In the different places where I've gone, I've seen the work of the Lord in the different nations, but also within our country. Let me just say, uh, for those of you who may not know what we do at Transform Nations, which was launched out of Mavuno uh, as a, an initiative, uh, we do some programs on leadership development, uh, we do some programs for men on responsible masculinity. We do shijadad, we do man enough. How many of you have done man enough? Let me hear ahu. Yeah, uh, those are real men. They have been trained about the five Ps and the definition of a man and things like that. But we have that program called man enough. And some of you are doing it currently. I think the last three years, uh, more than 3,000 men now have gone through Man Enough in different countries. Let's celebrate the Lord for what he is doing through that. <laughs> Recently, we graduated our first uh, team in Rwanda. We've been in Uganda. We've been in uh, Tanzania. And uh, we are now in the United States of America as well. So we thank God that God is doing something, a movement for men. We do something for boys, we do something for mothers of sons, uh, but just responsible masculinity that has been a pleasure for me to be involved in. 
But lastly, we do something on community transformation and how to get our people praying together and seeing that our nation and our communities would be transformed. So it's a great pleasure to be here today. Well, all the men who are here, let me, let me see you. All the men, just, just, just. <clears throat> wow. There are many more than I thought. If you're sitting next to a man, or someone who looks like a man, please look at them and say, it's good to sit next to you, you know. Uh, this is what I want to say to the men who are here. I'm not going to embarrass you. This is not uh, a session to beat you as men. I've been in several radio programs where all it was about was to attack the men and not talk about the real issues. So that's not going to happen this month. You need not fear. I've been there before. Uh, I've been attacked on TV before uh, by some people about masculinity. So that's not going to happen. How many of you are ladies who love men? In a positive way, you know? Uh, you're ladies, but you love men. Let me see. All right. This is also going to be about you because we're we going to be talking about the men you want to get married to, the men you're married to, and we're going to talk about the man next door. And we're going to talk about masculinity in general. So I'm really excited about this. Let me ask this, the ladies. Do extraordinary men exist? Be careful what you say, especially if you're sitting next to a prospect or your husband uh, or some other man. Do extraordinary men exist? All right. I'm surprised. This church has really become uh, spiritual since I was last year. When we were taught to describe what manhood means, they're just talking about God uh, and other things like that, which is a great thing. Uh, it's a great thing. Let me give you a story before I share God's word. <clears throat> this week I was in McQuenny County. I wasn't there to fight against MCS or to stand for governor, even though uh, I was asked by several people, would you want to run to be our governor? So I'm still listening to the voice of the people. Uh, when we make a decision, I will let you know. <laughs> Uh, true story. I was asked questions. Whether I'm going to respond or not, uh, that's uh, uh, not determined. But anyway, I, I was there and I went to the school where I grew up, where I went to uh, primary school as a little boy uh, in a village, a village that I've said before as a river beach. Uh, and so I went there and I went to the school and I was greeting the head teacher. Uh, and of course, when you go to the village, you're a big hit. Whatever you do, you just, because uh, you're driving a car and you have come and you speak some English and you have traveled around. So everybody respects you despite of what you do and who you are. They just respect you because you're a product of the village and now you're a little bit bigger than the village. So he began to give me a tour. I went to his little office and signed a book there. And then he began to give me a tour. And every class where we went, the teacher just stopped teaching. And we went inside, and I said hi to the kids. I felt big, you know. I felt celebrated. And I, I remember I went to Standard 8, uh, the candidates, and I stood there, and I said, I used to sit right here. Uh, the class is a little renovated than what it was. And I began to encourage them. But then... When I was walking out of a standard eight class where I was many years ago, I saw where we used to stand for parade or assembly. I remember something not so pretty about my first year in uh, primary school. I was standing and we were standing uh, first day in school. My brother is somewhere behind there and several others because there were many of us. Uh, but I'm standing there and this teacher is just giving stories, the head teacher, and it took a little bit too long. So after a while, I felt, you know, some warm liquid around myself. Uh, and it was pouring down, and those around me began to look around, and they began to move away, and I was left in a pool. Now, you know what happened. I was left in a pool there, and I'm standing there, and I'm feeling so embarrassed. I beat on myself. It's the first day in school, and I'm looking around. Everybody is laughing, and the teacher is saying, what's happening? And comes down to see, and everybody bursts out laughing. And I'm so embarrassed. 
And my brother, elder brother, came and said, let's go. What are you doing now? What are you making us look like? Uh, you know, and he was mad at me. And he took me away to the, uh, to the toilet to sort me out. But I remember when I came back to assembly because it was still going on. And then went back to class. I didn't want to talk to nobody. I was so embarrassed. That picture is still so real in my life. Why am I using it? I'm using it to tell you this. Until today, once in a while, when I do something silly or stupid or make some choices that I shouldn't make, I feel embarrassed. And I remember that time. And in my journey of manhood, so that you know who is talking to you is not perfect. In my journey of manhood, I've messed up sometimes. I've done some things I shouldn't have done. I've said some things to my wife once in a while that I regretted later. Why did I say it that way? I'm not a perfect man. I get surprised sometimes when I'm invited to talk shows and I'm told you're the expert of my men because you write about it and you train men. And I say, I may know a little bit more about men than many people after working with 3,000 men from different continents. You may know a few things, but I still have my struggles. I still want God to help me. I still have a dream to be a man of God's dream. And sometimes it doesn't happen as well and as pretty as I want it to happen. So, as I talk to you this month, I'm not telling you out of my own life script. Because I am not the standard unit, but the Bible is. So, from the Bible, we're going to learn what it means to be a real man, an extraordinary man. So, I'm excited to be able to do this. All right. Are you still there? Men, are you still there? The battle of the sexes, the two gender, has been there ever since the very beginning. In fact, many times when I get to talk a lot with men and then with women, it's like a battle. Some of you have watched Mentality, a program we've been doing with Ian Bugwa and Edward Quach, and it's a fight. When a lady comes in, usually it's us again as a lady, and it's uh, the women again as a man. And let me tell you what men think. A lot of the times men think that women are just too complicated, right? Men, they're just too complicated. They cry when they shouldn't be crying. They say there's nothing when you ask them what's wrong. And there's a lot, you know, they say the opposite. Uh, they take too long to leave home. This man is saying yes. <laughs> and he's sitting next to a woman. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure he understands what he's saying. Uh, and they're too emotional. I've heard many men say, I don't know how to deal with my woman. She just gets to cry over very little things. And they express a lot of emotion. And many men don't know what to do with that. So men think women are too complicated. Women think. Men never get it. They're too simple that it's complicated. <laughs> right, women? All right. Those are the ones who are not married. <laughs> who are saying it. You know, something men are just clueless emotionally. Uh, and and, and I, I, I believe there's some truth in that, in that. Not clueless, but we take a little bit longer just to grow in emotions. Sometimes I'm not even sure what I'm feeling. I have to ask my wife, what do you think I'm feeling? I'm feeling like this and that. How do you explain that? What is it in emotions so that I know what I'm feeling? Well... Many uh, women think men are just proud. It's just all about them. In fact, uh, when they are quarreling or attacking you because of something you did, it's really just about their ego. There's nothing more. It's about them. It's all about them. Culture is about them. It's, it's about them. Well, the gender discussion is foundational to human existence. It's more than political, it's more than social, it's more than economic, it's more than religious. It's both spiritual and theological. Spiritual and theological. Uh, this is why I'm passionate about this issue of men. The glory of God is reflected in human femininity and human masculinity. That means a gender issue has at stake the very glory of God. Where did I get that from? Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. In other words, man at its best is reflecting a certain image of God. That's why it's so 
uh, attractive. When you see a real man, very attractive. It points you to God, the almighty God who created man. The same with femininity. I've seen some flashes of great femininity in my wife. I've seen her express, you know, that glorified femininity that God put inside of her. Uh, that sin came to mess up. And when I see that, I say, wow, wow, that's God. That's the nature of God locked up in the heart of this woman that now I call my wife. There's such glory. That's why the battle of the days has been to destroy the gender issue. Women have been oppressed for many years, hence fem uh, feminism. They, they came up to begin to talk about the woman who was oppressed and put down by culture. Now it's taken another turn. So if you ask me on social media whether I'm a feminist, I'll probably think twice before I respond because it's a little different. I think you saw what has been going on in international social media about that topic. But when you see a man as well, attacked by the devil, put down, chained, fearful, you see the devil who doesn't like God. Is destroying masculinity as a way of getting back at God. This month, we're going to be talking. I wanted to lay that foundation. We're going to be calling men to their best. I'm going to give you four titles of a great man, the extraordinary man all of us dream about. We're going to be talking about that. But the unmarried women who are here, I want to ask you to begin to pray about this kind of a man. The parents who are here, who have daughters like myself, one is turning 13 uh, next month. I am praying about the husband, and I'm praying for a husband who is put together, who understands what it means to be a real man. I'm praying about that, and that's why we are here uh, talking about this. And then for the parents, how do you bring up your son to be the man that we're going to be talking about? So this is for all of us as we celebrate the glory of masculinity as we see it in the Bible. All right, look at me. Truth be told, masculinity is not at a good place today. It's not. As I talk to men themselves, many of them say, I don't feel like I'm who I want to be. I feel like I need to step up. I need to do something. Many men, that's why they are flocking to the Man Enough program. They fear less than sometimes they feel embarrassed by the decisions they make and they feel like they want more they want to show what it means to be a man and many of them feel like they don't have it they don't have it i was in a, a television uh, show once and we were discussing with this man who was just attacking what i was saying and then uh, off the camera the man looked at me and i saw a tear running down his cheek i said what's up is it what i said and he said, I want you to know that what I'm saying is for the sake of the camera. But inside of me, I'm struggling. He said, I don't go to church. Uh, you're a pastor. Would you find it in your, uh, yeah, would you make a decision? Would you love to come over and visit me and pray with me? And he told me in the last six months, I've had seven girlfriends. And I don't like it. I really don't like it. It's a lot of work. More so, it's expensive. I've used a lot of money that time. I'd like to get out of this mess, but I don't know how to. And then the camera came on, and he continued to attack me again. Masculinity is not in a good place today. Everywhere I've gone and I've asked men, how would you de describe masculinity? These are the words I've heard. Endangered. That men, real men, are endangered species. Others say weak, perceived, lost confused, unreal, untrustworthy, struggling. Many quote a movie that I love, Only a Few Good Men. In fact, a lady told me, only a few good men and all of them are taken and the rest are dead. <laughs> only a few good men. You know, churches, colleges, I was invited to go and speak in one of the universities around town recently, and I was told in the master's program, MBA, 82% of the participants in that program are women. And it's been like that for the last three or four years. So the, the, the lecturer was telling me, I'm getting a little worried that men don't want to become, maybe they did this long time ago and they don't want to do it, or they don't like to enhance their education. It's becoming 
are a concern for the college, colleges. What about counties? I've been invited in several counties to go and train the men. They're saying the men are drunk. They can't build the economy. It's the women who are building the roads. And county government are saying we're willing to throw a little bit of money to our gender uh, 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 ministry to be able to lift up the man. That never was thought about several years ago. Countries are thinking about it. Corporates. I was talking to uh, a few corporate entities here in the country uh, a few months ago. And I remember the HR person who had invited me in this most secular uh, corporate entity uh, called me after I talked to about 400 men that morning uh, were working there. And, and she came to me and she said, you know what? We're very concerned as a corporate entity because this is what is happening. The middle level and senior management, 90% of them are women right now. And they said, it's not like we don't want the men to rise up, but the men aren't interested in taking further education. They don't look confident. They don't look like they want to take this. In fact, she's told me something, if you're here, excuse me. Uh, but she told me something. She said, uh, a few months ago, we were interviewing some of the men uh, for uh, promotion to senior management, and we really wanted some man to make it. But looking at them, I knew they wouldn't make it again as the ladies that they were being interviewed. So I went and leaked some information to the man so that they may make it. I said, did it work? Uh, he said he wasn't really interested. So he didn't even say some of the things I told him to say. So they got four new managers, senior managers, who are ladies. And she said, I am so concerned. I'm willing for you to throw some money towards you to do a program for us for six months for the men. One of the banks, leading banks, called me as well and said, you know, we're really concerned about our men because we see the women are confident, they know what they want, they are go-getters, they are aggressive, but some of the men are just out there, you know, going to drink most of the evenings. They don't really look like they're aggressive and we don't want this bank to become feminine. We're not at a good place. In terms of masculinity, how did we get here? Let me say this very briefly and then move on. Role confusion. I think a lot of men don't exactly know what we are expected to do. It used to be clear, uh, traditional roles that men did, but there has been confusion through modernity and cultural changes. Uh, whether it's good, for good or for bad, it's up to you. But there has been role confusion in a big way. Many men, one after another, they come to me and say, so... What is my woman expecting me to do? She's saying this today, she says that tomorrow, and as we are walking, she says in between what she just said. So I don't know. What am I supposed to be? What's a man to do? Number two, no socialization. Most of the boys never get initiated as they used to be to masculinity. And like most of the girls who will find a mentor or two, a mother or two, to tell them what it means to be a girl. Uh, or a woman, but most of the boys, they figure out by themselves, no socialization or initiation. Number three, one of my favorite topics, the fatherhood crisis. We did a survey as an organization some months ago uh, and asked many people across this country, how many of you would say you have had a great father? Out of those we interviewed, only 12% of Kenyans said they think they have a great father. That's a crisis, if you ask me, because fatherhood determines the quality of gender, whether it's femininity or masculinity, and I've shared about that before. So the majority of the people in the nations of the world are either unfathered, they don't have a father, or misfathered, they've been fathered badly, or underfathered, and that's why they're in the prisons. Five years ago, I found out everyone in our Kenyan prison, everyone, the percentage of those in the Kenyan prisons, male and female, nine, uh, it was 78% of them never had a father growing up. So the fatherhood crisis is a big thing. And of course, because fathers pass on the baton of masculinity to the next generation, hence the crisis when you don't have great fathers. And the last one, empowered girl and woman phenomenon. I'm all for woman empowerment. I speak to women and I challenge them to move on and to realize that we are equal before God and God has a plan for us. So I'm all for that. 
But you see what happened? We lifted up one and never dealt with the other. And I'm not for one against the other. I'm for both of them to understand what it means to be whatever it is they're called to be. So when masculinity goes south, everyone feels the heat. Many ladies don't have a real man to marry. When they see those men uh, who want to buy them coffee, they don't really feel they belong to the league of extraordinary men. And so they will take their coffee but move on with life and continue to watch and pray. Uh, because we don't have the quality of men. Many women tell me, in every graduation of man enough, several women call me, some of you here, and say, may I come to the graduation and I hang around you and you show me some of the men who are not taken around there. And I faithfully do that and pray about it. A few of them have worked. My success rate has not been as high as I would like to. But people want a good man. Recently, I was caught by someone who was a big shot in the country, and she said, I want to get married. I'm 41, uh, and I want a good man. I'm a clubbing gal, so I don't meet them because those who club are not really all that. Uh, but you are in church, and you're doing some training. May I come? You give me a few candidates. So I told her, even those men who are now, uh, who are now extraordinary men, they also don't want a, a club girl. So you need to style up as well if you want a good man. All the men said. So when we're talking about getting back the glory of masculinity, is a concern of political governments. Is a concern of counties. Is a concern of the church. Is a concern of schools. In a certain mixed school where 60% of them are boys, 90% of the prefects are girls. So I went to the head teacher as a little man. I said, how could you do it this way? This is messed up. She said, help me out. I appointed boys to be prefects and they refused. They walk around sagging their pants, but I don't want to be prefects. So she told me, help me out. Could you help me deal with the boys to come up so that they may want to lead? Now, that sounds really grim. And some of you are wondering, so what do we do? I'm happy we are talking. This is, as I said, beyond church. It's a, a national, it's a global crisis. I was talking to one of the leaders of United Nations Women and was telling me, we'd like to invite you to come and talk to us because for many years we are focused on the girl child and now we are realizing we need to begin to focus on the boy child as well. Everyone across the world is beginning to realize something is not really right about masculinity. So let me ask, let me get down to what we're talking about. How do you define an extraordinary man? Let's get down to this. How do you really define? I'm going to be giving you four names that define that man. And you're going to be praying about it as you think about your man, those of you who are married. Uh, and as you think about your man in the future, those of you who are not. Let me go to the Bible and read something. This is one of my favorites, what I'm going to be sharing today. Genesis chapter 2. Let's go to where it all began. Are you still with me? All right. Genesis chapter 2. I want to read verse 8. Now the Lord planted, uh, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. There he put a man, the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the eye, sorry. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering uh, the garden flowed out of Eden. From there, it was separated into the four headwaters. The name of the first is Pishon. Uh, it winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good, aromatic, uh, resin and onyx are also there. The name of a second river is Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of a third river is Tigris. It runs along the east of Ashur. And the fourth river is a Euphrates. Verse 15. Let's read this together. One to go. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it. And to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded. Let me read the rest. 
commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you because you love man. Lord, you love masculinity. You created it. You want to show it off to the world because it shows the glory of yours. And we want to pray as we talk today that you will speak to us as man and then speak to us as the rest of a community around man. We pray that your power will be here. We pray for conviction. We pray for strength to share your word. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. The man was blessed in the garden. Look at me. The man was blessed in the garden. There was a territory and there were resources there. Talked about rivers, talks about trees, talks about fruit trees. Uh, you know, so he was meant to be a steward, a manager in that place, a territory. In verse 15, he was told, take care of it, cultivate it, add value to it. And then he was told, secure it. Make sure it's secure. It's in order. There's order in the place. When I look at that, I see man was meant and called to be in church, to take responsibility, to be a leader of his territory. In other words, in the chest of every man is some blood saying, I'm a king. I'm a king. That is why respect is such a biggie for man. You know, every time I've talked to men uh, in the counseling table and we are talking to men who uh, are married and their wives are there, I've never had a man say, this woman sitting next to me here doesn't love me. Never. Always they say, this woman sitting next to me doesn't respect me. Because for men, love is spelled respect. And it's not, some, it's not just about their ego. It's something about their assignment in life. They were created and given a garden. And they were taught, be in charge of it. And eventually the woman came. And they were taught, make sure this place is a good place. Build a kingdom that those who belong to it will be proud that you are their king. That's why we love power. That's why we love leadership and influence and success. How we use it is a matter of inquiry today. But men love to be in charge of an economy, to be a leader, uh, to have some vision. They love it. It's like in their DNA. That's why when men don't lead, they feel something about it. They don't feel good about it because they were born to do it. And all the men said, so what is the function of a king? Uh, I'm not talking about a man just walking around and demanding food and saying, you know, I'm the king of this home. Now, if you're the king of the castle, then behave like one. You don't need to say it. Everyone will know that you're the king because a king has certain behaviors, which is what I want to talk about. Number one, leadership. You see that throne at the back there? That throne is not to rest. That throne is not to sleep. That throne is not just to go there and hang out there. No, every time you see a throne, there's a responsibility on it. That men sit on a throne in leadership to be able to lead. Recently, I was, um, I was privileged about three weeks ago to be sitting in one of the most um, uh, liberal counties in the U.S., Boulder, Colorado. And we were talking with this man. I just come out, out of a retreat of 450 men. And we came and sat together and said, let's discuss the state of masculinity in the nations of the world. There was someone from Afghanistan. Uh, there was someone from uh, the U.S. There was someone from Mexico. And I was there from Africa and a few other leaders. And we began to say, what is the one thing we see with the men that we work with all over the world? After four hours of discussion and a lunch after that, we came to this conclusion greatest challenge of masculinity is lack of initiative. Lack of leadership. The guy from Mexico was saying, this man, most of them don't take initiative, don't lead. So what happens when the women complain? Then they shoot them or violence happens or something happens. The same with the guy from Afghanistan. He says, uh, children belong to the women. The men are never there. They never take responsibility. They take a gun and some opium, opium and go to the bush. They're never really responsible for their children. And of course, I had some things to say as well, which I don't need to say. But taking initiative seems to be the greatest global challenge of masculinity. What does that mean? Passivity. 
being tentative, indecisive, soft. You see, I have come to see from the Bible the silence and the inaction of Adam is a curse of masculinity. When Adam was there and he was given a church over his territory and then an invasion came, the serpent came and Adam did nothing, said nothing, never acted. That's what brought us to the problem where we are at. And man, as I talk to you today, I have been there many times. There are times I knew I needed to do something for our marriage and I sat there, froze, almost not moving. And I know I need to move and I struggle about it. I say, God, deliver me from this. Inaction, lack of initiative. Kings must have a vision a future, an idea of where they're going. And leadership begins with self-leadership. So before you're excited about a man, after he rides in a good car, uh, and after he shows you the kind of phone, HTC, uh, that he is using, you need to ask him, by the way, what's your vision in life besides having an HTC and a German car? What do you want to do in life? What's your mission? What's your value? What are you going to do with your life? Where are you going? Because I want to go somewhere. And let him say it. Are you in charge of your life, man? Are you leading yourself? Because you have a land to conquer, something to accomplish, a mission in life, a cause to live for, and a name to share with your woman and with your children. Are you leading yourself? Because that is important. Are you a man who is leading? Or do you just carry the title of leadership? A great man uses his gifts and strength and power to build a kingdom that his people, those around him, will be proud to belong to. So a great man is a leader in relationships, at work, at home, in the community. He has a vision. He, he has a hope for the future. He's mobilizing towards a course of action. He's giving directions. He's asking the right questions. But, ladies, before you uh, get hard on me, let me ask you, what is leadership? Because I have had this discussion with many women, including feminists, uh, and we have discussed, is a man called to lead naturally or is it a cultural construction? I believe it's given by the Lord. I believe it's written in the DNA of every man. But it's not, it's not something to be used for domination. I believe leadership is not domination. It's facilitation based on sacrifice and servanthood. That's what leadership is. Matthew 20, 25 to 28, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, just like the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus was teaching leadership is not sitting there and waiting to be served. And wondering, where is the woman? I don't have food. Where is the woman? She should be taking care of the baby. That's not what leadership is. Leadership is facilitating an environment of growth, of progress. A good environment. That's what leadership It's being a servant. I've, I have caught myself many times playing the boss. I remember one time we went home. My wife was tired. She was probably more tired than I was. And I went to the sitting room and sat down, put my uh, feet up, and began to watch Al Jazeera and CNN and everything else. And she went to the kitchen, and she almost fell down trying to prepare a meal because she was so tired. But I'm there, and I'm waiting for her to come, you know, to bring the food. And she brought the food, and she said, I am so tired. And I said, there's no water here. And then I talked to myself. I said, Simon, Really? I said to myself, you know, you need to grow up from cultural hang-ups. You need to be able to be a servant and say, what's a wise thing to do right now? What's a servant thing to do right now? And I went and I said sorry to her and I went to the kitchen and did the rest of the work. And I went and made the bed, which I usually don't do for her. Uh, I, 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 and I was trying to serve my woman and it felt good to do it because we were born for it, to be leaders by example. And all the men said... Whenever a man is a servant king, he will be celebrated in every culture. When I talk to women who are opposed to this thing of leadership and kingship for men, it's because they say it has been misused. The fat 
that it has been used doesn't make it irrelevant. Don't throw the baby away with the bath water. Clean up the baby and take the baby home. Servant King serves his family, attends school functions. I've been called to many schools across this country to talk to the men because they don't go for school functions. The best I've seen is 25% of men who go for school functions. The rest are women. Uh, they are not serving their families by attending school functions, listening to their teenagers, dropping kids to school, uh, caring enough to make time for their wives, ensuring that their par parents are catered for, listening to their sons. They're not really involved. They're not responsible. They're not servants. A leader should, not, should lead and not abdicate his responsibility of leadership. When a man wouldn't lead, he's an abdicator. And Adam refused to lead. And we have said this is why we are where we are right now. So many men blame others because they are not leading. Manliness and responsibility are the same thing. Many men have quit and abandoned their throne. But they insist on their title. I can't tell you how many women I've seen cry because their men are not present. I can't tell you how, may, how much I was touched a few uh, weeks ago when a child came to me and said, Simon, would you help me talk to my daddy? Because he's not there. I said, I have tried my best to try and get to daddy and to relate with him, but he wouldn't. He's pushed me away, and this child is crying. He's seven years old, and he said, would you help me? And he's saying, I just want a daddy. I just want him to be involved in my life. When men abandon their throne, tears go to the streets. A lot of people get to suffer. When the man is absent, <clears throat> spiritual leadership, when the man is taken over by alcohol, like in some of the counties in our nation, or taken over by pornography or some other habit, all of us get into trouble. Recently, we had Mutudo come for a graduation of men, and he was saying, how can we work together to help the men? Because I'm concerned about it, and I'm not winning this war. How can we work together? Because this is for all of us. When men don't lead, somebody goes to tears. Someone will suffer. The next generation will pay for it. Government and our taxes will pay for it by recruiting more soldiers and more police to deal with the wayward youths because a man never sat on his throne that he loves to be respected for. But then some of the kings lord it over. As the Bible says here, they abuse power. The day before yesterday, I gave a lift to a Maasai friend who is our our one of our security guys in my estate here, and we began to talk. I said, by the way, Eru, uh, I hear sometimes you beat up your wives for a certain reason. He said, yeah, I do that to my wife. I said, how long have you been married? He said, three years. I said, should you be beating uh, or fighting uh, or having violence, domestic violence against your wife? And she said, if I don't do that, you will not respect me. So we had a long chat. And we talked, and then I looked at uh, I looked at him. I said, "You're a young man." He said, "Yeah, I'm 25." Uh, I said, uh, "You know that that woman that you're having violence against? She's also a creation of God." And I talked to him uh, for a while. At the end of it, he looked at me and said, "You know, nobody has ever challenged me like that." And he said, let me tell you something. I commit myself. And he raised up his little stick that he was carrying. He said, I commit myself. I will never beat my wife again. I'll treat her well like a queen. <clears throat> so that's a leader. You don't have to lord it over. You don't have to say, I am the man in this house. You don't have to raise your voice. You just need to be a man on the throne, leading, having a vision, doing what leaders do. The second thing about a king is provision. See, the man here was supposed to tend the garden and ensure our productivity. And a man is called to do exactly that, to lead in wealth creation, in uh, uh, making sure the living standards of his little kingdom called family is doing well. Think about financial principles of saving and staying out of debt, investing and giving. And this is one area my wife challenges me a lot to do. Lead us in terms of planning. And I'm rising up to it. 
but men are called to be providers. Well, the economy of a nation is not doing well. We talk to the leader, to the president, because leadership and provision go together. This is the one thing I want you to take home today. A great man is a servant king who leads and provides with integrity. Let's say that together. One to go. All the men, let's say it together with our base. One to go. Who leads and provides with integrity. Now, provision. It doesn't mean that women need to be gold diggers. But they need to look at you and say, do you have the money? Then you can make a good husband. No, provision is more than that. It's about a vision of a future. Yes, you may have a good car, a good phone, but that doesn't make you a great man. It's much more than that. So a great man is a servant king who leads and provides with integrity. Let me close with this. What are the two characteristics of an extraordinary king? I want to read from Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, I love this. It's not about the woman, it's about the man. Verse 1, the sayings of King Lemuel, an oracle his mother taught him. This is the mother who taught this king. And this is what he said, Oh my son, or son of my womb, or son of my vows, do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. Listen to what it says, verse 4. It's not for kings or Lemuel, not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what the Lord decrees and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Give beer to those who are perishing, wine to those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of uh, all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Two things. This is what I hear the mother saying to the son. He's saying to the son, two things, my son, as you grow up, as you become a man, number one, have integrity. Have integrity. Think about moral integrity. Think about financial integrity. Think about relational integrity. He tells him, you know, don't intoxicate yourself with wine. Let that not be what you do as a king. Because you're going to have a hangover and you will not make the right decisions about your relationship and about moral choices and many other things. And he said, whatever you do, don't be taken over by lack of integrity. So have integrity. Number two, I hear him saying, be selfless. Speak for the poor. Preserve yourself so that you may be able to help those who need to be lifted. Be selfless. Two characteristics. A great man is a servant king who leads and provides with integrity. Kings should be men of integrity. And this is very personal to me. Every king vows to lead using a constitution. They commit to a constitution. They say, these are my values. This is what I will do. A king is bound by a constitution. Fear a man who has no convictions. Well, anything goes for him. It's going to mess you up. Fear a man who is a law by himself. It's about what he feels. He doesn't really commit to the word of God and to convictions that he has. Fear a man who is a man not under authority. This is what I've learned. Every time I bow the knee as a king to the king of kings and I submit myself to him, then I become a great king. A great king is a man who bows the knee to the real king of kings and invites him to be his leader. He's a man of God. Let me say that again. He is a man of God. A man who doesn't fear God. He could do anything. He could do anything. He may have the car, the limousine, the money, but you don't know what he's going to do in a few months down the road because he doesn't have anything holding him back. There are many times I've had temptations to do some things which are crazy. But the thing that held me back as a man is that I fear the almighty God and have a king that I serve in my masculinity. A king who bows the knee to others. I think the most attractive thing about a man is a man who can bow the knee and begin to pray. 
I say, God, I can't do this. I need your help. The king must submit and follow the king of kings because that's what integrity is about. I love Joseph, who was a man who made a decision. A woman was here, a well taken care of woman in a rich uh, family close to Pharaoh. And she was the one who was coming at Joseph and said, Joe, let's do something here. And the man took off and he said, I can't do that. Not because it's culturally wrong. It was beyond that. But because I don't want to do something against my God. It's about his faith. He was a man of faith. When a man doesn't commit to truth, everything he desires is truth to himself. So fear him. Because he's going to make up truth. We see the king in a, in a man. When he refuses to bribe. Even when it could cost him his job. We see a man in a king. The king in a man. When he shows true remorse. For wrong he has done. And he's willing to change. Because men are not perfect. When he keeps his word. When it's within his power to do it. And he's not a liar. When he respects others. Even the weakest and the least. If you're riding with a man and he's shouting at the watchman, one day he's going to shout at you if you're not married yet. Because he doesn't respect the weakest of a society. If you see a man who is not honest and open with his money dealings, there's a problem. But we see the kink in a man who is humble, aware of his limitations, quick to ask for help, who is committed to paying his debts, who hates and confronts injustice work, who quits porn and say, I don't want to continue in this habit. I want to be different. You see, a great man is a servant king, but who leads and provides with what? With integrity. He's selfless. He's benevolent. He's a hero to his people. He wants to bless. He wants to lift up. He wants to make sure everybody around his territory is blessed. He's going to be a servant to his queen. Let me close it this way. I have smiled when I've seen a man who is working so hard selflessly to provide for his family. And for all the men here who provide for your families, may the Lord bless you. I've talked to some men who have got to be coerced by the court to provide for their children that they give seed for. That's not masculinity. That's lack of it. But a real man says, this is my responsibility. I'm going to work hard and I'm going to provide for my very own. I have seen the beauty and glory of masculinity. When I've seen a man empower a poor person and say, you're a watchman, but I want to give you some education and help you out so that you don't have to do this forever. I have seen the glory of masculinity when I've seen a man get home early, go to work, and then rush back to go and help his challenged child in one way or another. A man who is saying, I want to make time for my wife, so I'm not going to go and work far away from home as much as it depends on me because I value my family. That's a real man. I've seen a real man who is willing to come and serve in church and give up some of his wealth towards the ministry of the gospel and realize that he wants to be selfless in promoting the kingdom of the king of kings. That's a great man to me. A great man is a servant king who leads and provides with integrity. So man, the man who is here today, are you submitted to the king? Are there areas in your life that you need to take initiative in? Every day you make a crown for your kingship. Is there an integrity crack in your life that you need to bring to the Lord to fix? Is there a relationship you need to stop? Is there a number in, on your phone book that you need to delete? Is there a leak in your house that you need to fix? Do you need to avail yourself at home and give leadership? Do you need to pay a debt and draw a budget for your family and for your own life? You need to apologize to a family uh, member or pursue reconciliation with someone else. Do you want to be a king who takes initiative? Do you want to begin to provide for your child? and Say, I gave this seed, I'll, I'll support this child. 
Do you want to cast vision for your teenager who is running amok and say, this is my baby. I'm going to be involved, whatever that takes. Do you want to be a selfless king, a servant king who leads and provides with integrity? Servant kings, this is our call. What if, what if, what if in this nation we had men who would take up their position? What if we had men who saw themselves as seven kings and instead of hanging on to the title, they went for the responsibility of their throne? What if in relationships we had men who are willing to lead and say, this far we go, no farther. What if we had men who are willing to go and look for their children wherever they are and get connected with them? What if the men of this church decided, I want to be a servant king. I want to lead. I want to provide. And I want to do that with integrity. What would happen? I tell you what would happen. Less of women who are hurting would be sitting here. I tell you what would happen. The society would begin to use less money to send men to prison. I tell you what would happen. Men would walk tall and feel good about themselves because they were born for this. Women, what's your part? How can you allow your man to lead? How can you pray and respect your man? How do you begin to bring up your child, your son, to be this kind of a king? How do you celebrate your sons and the men around you who are standing as servant kings? How do you celebrate them? I want to call the men to prayer right now. I was very impressed in our last <clears throat> inauguration when Uhuru and Ruto, whatever you think about them, our president and deputy, they knelt down and they were prayed for. They realized, as they had been taught by some, as they had had a discussion, that we need the king of kings and the Lord of Lords. And they nail down. Whether that has become a reality or not is for you to judge. But it was exciting to see it on CNN that two leaders of a nation kneel down and ask for prayer. That's what men do. That's what I want to call the men in this church to do today. We're going to go down on our knees. We're going to do two things. Number one, we're going to ask God to forgive us we have not taken our role seriously. That someone somewhere is hurting because we either didn't play ball and lead and provide with integrity or because we did it in a wrong way and we hurt someone. There's, there are many women right here, in here, who have been wounded by men who wouldn't become servant kings. So we're going to go down, starting with myself. I have a lot to confess and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for being a child on a throne. But sometimes I've done childish things. And I want to grow up to be a leader. So I'll start with myself. But secondly, we're going to tell God. 